value in any situation is always going to be communicated through your understanding of the client. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. I hope all you listeners are in good spirits. I'm here joined by the CEO of the business of architecture, Mr. Enoch Sears himself. How are you, sir? Hello, Ryan. Good to have you on the show as always and, and yeah, good to be have here. one of our wonderful conversations. So today we're going to talk about a problem that we hear a lot here at Business of Architecture with our clients when there is frustration that has been built up with the relationship with a client because the client is seeing you as a burden. They're not recognizing the value of the architect and the whole fact that they have to have an architect seems like a problem, seems like a burden, seems like an unnecessary expense. And that's a really difficult situation to, to be in as an architect. It's quite deflating, it's quite undermining, and it can be a real obstacle to charging certainly premium fees. And I think it's becoming, again, you know, it, it's certainly becoming a more default paradigm that other people in the construction industry are in. And there's a wider conversation around why that is and, and what, what that's about. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Today we're going to talk about just understanding what this what this situation is when the client sees you as a burden and what you can actually do to avoid it. And I think both Enoch and myself are very much on the in the camp of taking responsibility for it because when we take responsibility for how we're being perceived then we've got a lot of options open up of how we can start to influence it. So it's a we it's good we can get into the complaint about how everyone is shitting on the architect and seeing them as a burden and all this other kind of stuff. But when we take it on as as part of it's something that we have we failed to communicate. Something's missing. Okay, and if we look at it like that, then it becomes a much more empowering conversation. Absolutely. Something's missing. An understanding, a clarification, something. Something's causing this per this perception to continue. Something causing this per perception to be embedded. Something is causing this perception to be perpetuated about and, and I'll give an example here because earlier today we were on so those of you who are listening maybe for the first time here at Business of Architecture over the past 10 years, we've developed uh, a program, call it an executive training program for firm leaders, where we walk you step-by-step step through how to implement the smart practice method in your practice to get more freedom fulfillment and exceptional financial reward. And so on one of the calls that we had that are part of the program with the students who are going through this program, uh, one of the architects is a very accomplished architect, doing very well financially. But he's just talking about some of the challenges, current challenges that he's having. And he mentioned a small project that they're working on right now where the client has, they hired the low bidder, which is not uncommon. So uh, in terms of the, the contractors who are bidding for the project, the, the client ended up going with the lowest bidding contract, contract, contractor. Um, obviously not uncommon. You know, so every client's different. Sometimes clients... They will disqualify whoever's at the bottom. They'll disqualify whoever's at the top, and they'll try to shoot for the middle. In any case, in this case, they ended up with a contractor who was sort of like in over his head with this particular job. So he's a, he's a, he's a contractor who does residential work, and this is a commercial project. So obviously, the building codes are different from residential to, to commercial, as well as the construction standards are, are different. Uh, this particular product's being built with metal studs, so just that in and of itself is different than uh, wood construction that we have here in the U.S. and and this this firm owner was just just venting uh, responsibly, of course, but he was venting about how 
the client has become has started to complain about the architect site visits and is seeing their their involvement in the contract administration process as being a burden as being a cost and and you know kind of not wanting the architects to be out there as much because he's just seeing that he's having to pay for their $300 an hour visits out to the job site and so this firm owner kind of expressed, so, yeah, I've never been able to really crack this nut. It seems like clients, when we get to the construction, the contract administration phase, that they always start to see us as, as an unnecessary expense. They start to see us as a burden. Not only that, but oftentimes, because the contractor's there every single day and the client is probably on site as well, the client, the architect gets blamed for a whole load of stuff specifying things that are too expensive, maybe not knowing what they're doing in certain regards. When in this case, the reality of the, the, reality of the situation is that the, the contractor's in over his head and he's, he's stretching. He's stretching to do a project that's, that's um, more involved than what he's used to. And so as a result, there's a lot of change orders happening. There are some things that are being installed incorrectly. So the, instru- uh, the inspectors come out to the site and they're like, okay, this you install the light fixtures incorrectly. You can't do them like this. You got to take them out and redo it according to the plans. And then, of course, the contractor, it's because the contractor has the ear of the client. It's easy for the contractor to say, oh, it's that architect. You know, these drawings don't make sense. I don't understand them. And so then the architect ends up getting painted in a bad light. So there's a lot of different ways we can look at this perception of how you as an architect or uh, your firm may be perceived as as the bad guy in these situations. And this can be really, it's really frustrating for architects because we know that these things are not costs. We know that these things are saving the client money, typically. Now, not all the time, but typically the reason why, a con- why an architect would do contract admin is because they want to save the improper installation of things. They want to catch things early so that they prevent mistakes from happening, right? But as you start off this episode, Ryan, we're talking about what do you do when, you know, how do you handle that when clients who's a burden? Because if it's not happening now on a project, it may happen later in a project. And a lot, sometimes too, clients, they might not even express to you that they feel like you're a burden, but in the back of their head when they're going to sleep, they're thinking, man, these architects, I, mean, I wish we didn't have to work with them. So there's an example of when an architect can be perceived as a burden, just one it, small example. It's, it's, it's very frustrating and it's very frustrating for, for us because we hear our clients talk about these scenarios all the time. We had another client recently who had been working on a project up to planning phases here in the UK and the project had, was about to be submitted and the, the scope had grown quite significantly as often happens in a project the house started off the clients said they wanted one thing the reality of it was when conversations started unfolding and more details were coming up they wanted more and more things to put into the house the scope expands an initial uh, costing gets put out the price of the estimate is considerably more than what they had uh, you know what they were thinking about at the at the the architects kind of starting to get blamed and the architect is now wanting more fees because the project has expanded and that's not i bet the client's not thrilled about that and the, of course the client was not happy about that at all the contractor who brought the architect on to the project was not happy about it and it's a very difficult situation for the for the architect because they were like well Going forward, it has to be more fees because the project is it's a totally different project and you guys are saying that this is what you want. You're saying that you want this, but now you want, you're expecting me to work at a, a lower fee on what's deserved or what's needed to deliver this project properly. And it was a very unfortunate situation as this person ended up um, parting ways with the contractor because the contractor was just like, well, we'll do this. We'll do the rest of the service for them. Sure, sure. That always goes. <laughs> that goes and, great. And you know, our our client held their ground about you know we're we're not going to budge on on this. This is what's needed for the project. This is what you've been asking for. It was a very difficult scenario in the sense that the client had been brought to the architect through the contractor, and now the contractor was um, kind of the contractor was in cahoots with the client and 
kind of saying, well, I, you know, they weren't advocating for the for the architect. They weren't advocating for the value that the architect would bring, particularly that was needed for such a complex project to deliver it at a high level of, of calibre. And again, it was just another another example of the architect being seen as a unnecessary cost. And it's very rare that... It's very rare that uh, a client actually gets to see the real cost of the architect compared to the rest of the investment that they're making on the project. And also what the investment in the architect, how much money it saves them and how much and how much pain it makes them avoid. That's the other that's the other thing. And one of the perhaps more difficult things about being an architect is that a lot of the services are navigating somebody through holes and dangerous precipices and ghouls and dangerous situations that they never knew that they were actually exposed to in the first place which is yeah, what, again this is scary we, forest which is which is again which is actually kind of we can start to see that being on part of our responsibility to educate the client to know that that's what we're we're guiding them through we're guiding them past and there's a there's a, a skill to be able to kind of frighten the client without it being you know always doom and gloom and negativity one of the one of the results of this is that you as an architect end up being in the in the uncomfortable position of having to having to justify your fees in other words you're you're having to you're already on your back foot and now you're having to explain and justify why you're valuable oftentimes if you get to that point it's kind of it's almost too late and it's not but it, it's kind of like We've got to ask ourselves the question: How did we? How did we get here? You know, how did I get here? And it was asking this question has been very useful in my life, which is like, okay, here's where I am. How did we get here? What ended up? Where, where's the road that led to this this intersection? And when fees become contentious, yeah, I mean, client to client relationships can be damaged, as Ryan mentioned. Uh, with this example, there obviously, I, w I would doubt that this contractor is going to refer work to this architect in the future. Right, so you may lose a referral source. Uh, it's not good for anyone. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult, it's a difficult, unpleasant, messy situation, and we can expand upon it as well. You know, when fees become contentious, or when we're struggling to justify our value, there are there are definitely certain phases of the architectural scope of work that a client can more is more easily able to understand the value if you like and those are those stages of work perhaps it's in the concept phase often it is they can see a lot of value what the architect brings in but once they've once there's an initial set of drawings they're like well why, why do i need you anymore we've got this i'm just going to take these drawings and sometimes when i've been in a situation in the early days of business where the client is so sure on this that almost your part believing them. Oh, I did any of the rest of these drawings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. is my whole existence meaningless? Exactly, what a, yeah. They seem so confident. They, that's all they need. That's all they need to get to get the rest of this done. Why can't they just go off and build it? But it's very difficult to know without actually having the experience of what what happens when you give contractors missing information and the experience of having misaligned expectations of oh I wasn't expecting the floor to do that oh i had no idea that beam was going to be there in the middle of our kitchen oh the windows don't go down to the to the floor oh there's all all these sorts of oh i wasn't expecting it to be that kind of quality of material and yeah, what, it's there, you know a lot of it is just unclear expectations uh, i remember hearing about a a client who had had a custom home built and the lady who was um, commissioning the project was very very fastidious shall she shall we say and she came in and she looked at the floors that had been specified that had already been installed and they were like this natural wood and it had like this ebony finish on it but because it was a natural wood and whatever the finish was they finished it afterwards so it wasn't pre-finished she wasn't happy with how the stain laid down on the floor. 
she found that it, it looked like there some areas were darker, some areas were lighter, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this is this is this is the reality with any natural substance. When you have a natural substance, you're going to find and usually you'll see disclaimers, you know, on 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 products that are that are part of like nature. You know, just saying like, hey, there may be discoloration, there may be there may be things, maybe different sizes. That's just because it's a product of nature. And 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 of course, in the specifications, there were certain specifications about about these variations, uh, which is typical for architects. You know, we're gonna we're gonna deliver the specifications, but built into every specification is a tolerance, meaning there's a tolerance for variation. You know, even in our general notes and our drawings, uh, you know, there was a tolerance for for dimensions either a 16th inch or an eighth of an inch, depending on what you're measuring to and what you're installing. Like a wall, you don't need, you don't need 1 32nd of an inch typically uh, for a wall measurement. You know, if you're, the, if you're the architectural intern who's, you know, you're showing your project architect the drawing and it has like 3 32nds of an inch, or <laughs> gonna, you're gonna have a little, you're gonna have a little less in there, right? That you're gonna wanna generally try to stick to the inch, maybe the half inch when you're, you're measuring. You know, you don't want to see things, a whole string of walls measured to the eighth of the inch. So clients don't understand that there's tolerances within architecture, that, you know, even studs themselves can be not exactly straight all the time. You know, walls will not always be 100. We're not building a spaceship here. This isn't NASA. You know, this is a, this is a building, and yes, there's tolerances, and yes, we want to get it to a certain level, a standard of care, as they call it. So part of this is just the misunderstanding where clients think that, Everything is like written in stone. Like once you get those drawings, it's like the Ten Commandments. You cannot deviate from this, and it's it needs to be exactly this way, exactly like it says. As opposed to understanding that no, there's actually wiggle room built in because we're being expeditious about how much time we spend designing something. You could design it out to the nth degree, and of course, that's going to massively increase the cost of design. So part of this process is again that the clients have an unclear expectation about what they're getting, about what's involved in architecture, about how the whole process works. So when we look at the possibility, let's let's flip over and say, okay, those are some of the problems that we suffer. What are some of the possibilities? So let's imagine that your clients actually see you as an asset. They see you as a trusted advisor. They see the fees that they pay you as, as valuable investments. They're happy to pay those fees because they know that you're safeguarding their best interest. Yeah, so there's an under, understanding from the client side and I think most importantly an appreciation. You know, actually having a relationship with with your client where they say thank you and they appreciate the the kind of little the thoughtfulness that goes into a lot of the details and how you're, you know, the the care that's helping avoid certain pitfalls or the money that's being saved you know or the the mistakes that are being avoided that's the, that's you know that's one of the things where you know so many times the client is not aware of the mistakes that had the potential of being very real very expensive very timely you know very obtrusive to the whole project as a whole and you've graciously navigated through them without without kind of falling into I think if clients understood that this idea of being much more appreciative would be you know really 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 great I'll give you an example of this actually I'm I'm on our we're doing our apartment in New York and we've been um renovating it and the the general contractor that we have worked with was an architect and he's he's not normally a general contractor but he took on the GC role for our project because he's he was an architect who's now become a mill worker and like a furniture maker and he just builds these just extraordinary bits of furniture and things like that and he's a, a good friend and he came in and and did a lot of the the mill work in our in our house but he took it a step further and this was kind of part of him being him thinking like an architect, not like a general contractor, where he wanted to make sure that his millwork looked as good as it possibly could in the context of the space and became so demanding of the other sub consultants or the other builders, the other tradespeople that were in the space that it was like this whole level of extra value that I kept 
And I kept, you know, I was talking to Yvonne a lot of the time. I, a little example, somebody came in to install the radiator and the guy who wanted to install the radiator wanted to, wanted to have it, you know, half a foot, a foot off the wall because basically that's where the pipe was and he didn't want to muck around with having a finding a different bent pipe and whatever, com- it was just more complicated for him, him to have it inset on the wall. And Roman, the, uh, the mill worker, basically frightened him and had and had had a go at him in the past for taking those kind of shortcuts had a very stern conversation with him and was like you're gonna do it like this and here's how you can figure it out and it's easy and just do it and he went and did it and it was like one of those one of those little things that you know we would have been really upset if the radiator was not where we wanted it and the he could have the, the tradesperson could have easily convinced me of like okay well that's you know it's too complicated, blah blah blah. And we'd be like, okay, fine, whatever. Yeah. But that, but that little bit of extra control was like, oh, we got what we wanted, and that's that's what architects do. That's the that's that's the the kind of strength and the, and when you magnify that over the whole course of a, a project, lots of little decisions. That's the that's the value. Yep. So the challenge here, and what what needs to be done when we look at a solution here, the principle is is that you number one you need to be able to communicate this is a communication issue so let, let's pretend like you as an architect you who are listening to this podcast today uh, you're, you're not a charlatan you're not someone who's ethically ripping people off you're not cheating people you actually do have great value and so then the challenge is communicating that value in a way that people understand in a way that they get not only that they get it but they actually own it because see there's a difference when you're in communication there's a difference between someone understanding what you're saying someone getting what you're saying and someone actually owning the idea or the concepts behind what's being communicated. So value, the key principle here is that value in any situation is always going to be communicated through your understanding of the client, meaning you need to be able to meet the client where they're at with how they perceive the world if you have any chance of influencing that perception. This is Story comes to mind. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull draw from my marriage here because this is something that, <laughs> like communication is huge in any relationship and partnership. We were we were over there in England uh, uh, about a week ago, and we're coming back and we're on the train and we were we were just talking about something insignificant and I shared I shared an insight a revelation that I had popped into my head. I'm sharing it with my wife and and she wasn't getting it. She wasn't understanding what I was saying, and so it devolved into a bit of an argument, right? And so now we have, I mean, I don't like being in an argument with my wife. Now we have, we have bad feelings on both sides. The connection's broken. So I want, I'm looking to restore the connection. And as I was thinking about that situation and exactly what had occurred, what had happened there, I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't in my wife's shoes. So I didn't actually understand her perspective. So because of that, I was doing things like trying to convince her that I was right, show her my perspective, trying to get her to understand me instead of following of course, what the, the, what the great business consultant Stephen R. Covey says is seek first to understand and then to be understood. So part of this process of you communicating your value, if you're going to have any shot of, let's say, getting a raise from your boss, of hiring a new client, any, any sort of persuasion that you have in your interaction with another human being, you must be able to step into their world, see how they're viewing things, and then from there, then we can chart a path to where we both want to go together. Absolutely. So it's it's really the context through where value is communicated is understanding and, under, and understanding another person's perspective, paradigm, and in the context of sales, we always talk about we talk about the problem or the pain. Like, what are the real emotional drivers behind the project where are the where are the things that cause upset and this takes a little bit of time and skill to a develop that kind of relationship with the client so that you can understand what what you know understand what it is that's motivating them and again if we're dealing with commercial clients this is where becoming good and well versed in what are the commercial pains and problems that their businesses are dealing with? What are their what are the challenges they're facing? What are the 
issues that they're constantly butting up against? Where are they losing money? Where do they want to be making money? Where is their their big vision? And they've got to be, they've you know, the project that they're working on, they've got to be motivated to complete it. Exactly. And if, if, so if, you know, yeah, if a client sees us as a burden, sees architects as a burden, then part of our job is to actually step into the client's world and understand why. Okay, great. Now, they may not communicate that they see us as a burden, but generally we can go into it thinking that, you know, they're going to want to see our value. That's another way of stating this is like, okay, they're going to want to see our value. So then we need to step into their world. And it's not easy to do. It's not easy to do, which is why it's a lifelong journey to hone your skills of communication to understand. But sometimes, for instance, you may you may want to understand why why do they feel that we're a burden or why would they not want us to do CA or something like that? Well, maybe because they're concerned about the cost. And so we're like, okay, so is is cost your primary concern in this instance? They might say, yes, it is. And then you can say, okay, great. If cost is your primary instance, would it make a difference if you were to see that conclusively that this investment in the servants with us is actually saving you multiples guaranteed of what you spend with us? And then, then see, then you can start to leverage on what they said they actually care about and show them how what we do matches up with that, right? So when we, when we don't ask enough questions, when we don't lean in with curiosity to try to figure out someone else's worldview, we make the mistake of making assumptions. Another example, we had a, a client a architect who was, again, talking to us about a, a project, a, an amazing project that he just won, but he almost lost it. Because he discovered along the process that they had, even though they agreed to work with him, they had they had started looking at other options and other architects. And so typically his first reaction was, oh no, maybe it's about the cost. Maybe they're trying to shop me around to find a cheaper architect because, you know, this architect doesn't compete on price. That's what we teach. He competes on value. And that's a normal assumption for most of us to make when we hear that a client's shopping us around or whatever. Oh, it must be about the cost. Well, fortunately, he put on his cap of curiosity, leaned in. And instead of getting defensive about it or getting belligerent or getting offended or anything like that, or even feeling frustrated, leaned in with curiosity to find out what actually was going on. And what, what he ended up discovering was that this particular client, it wasn't the money, it was actually the time that, that was projected for the project to take that they were concerned about. And when he dug deeper, he discovered, oh, it wasn't just because they're just, they just want to rush things. No, they had a pending health crisis that they, that they needed to have this space finished by a certain time. So they had a looming deadline about something very important in the world that they couldn't change. And so then once the architect knew that, he was then able to enter into a conversation. Okay, well, let's see if we could make this work. Like, what if we could do this in a less amount of time? Would that make sense? And let's find a solution that allows you to do that, right? There's other things to play with. Maybe it costs you more. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe we reduce the scope. There's a lot of different things that happen. But that was only possible because he actually stepped into the world. And like Ryan so beautifully said, he understood. He understood. And so because of that, then he was able to create this, this enrollment. And what ended up happening is when he did that, the clients actually trusted him way more because they felt understood. And so this is a great example of what we're talking about today, of flipping around and being perceived as a burden to actually being perceived as a valuable advisor, as a valuable consultant, as a valuable asset to the project. I think it's really interesting, actually, you know, that we're talking about value and the way that we don't communicate. So where we fail to communicate is also where we're, f it is also kind of degrading our value. What do you mean? And so for some clients, some clients, let's, let's look at high end luxury clients. They come with a, with a kind of expect a service expectation. They're looking for an experience as well. They're not, it's not just, you know, the, the project they're looking for something which is going to either sustain or maintain or up level their current state, their status. Okay. And they're also looking for an experience of being looked after, being advised, or just being made to feel special. And I, I see this a lot with our, with our clients and then people I interview who are very good with the, the kind of high level, you know, ultra high net worth individuals, that they communicate a lot of value through just the way they care for 
the client with little extra things like just being being clear or they create a kind of hospitality type of experience for the client they remember things they remember birthdays or they you know the the process is kind of nicely clearly laid out there's just imbuing trust um i interviewed a practice recently and they deal with a lot of high net worth individuals in the new jersey region and they had hired a consultant who specialized working with the mandarin oriental the ritz carlton the four seasons and this consultant was coming in and training all of their team members on how to create a luxury experience for these sorts of clients and this just was little things like how to answer the phone and to make the client feel at ease or to make them feel like they're being catered for and looked after not a kind of experience where the client rings up and they don't get any message back or they don't hear from the architect for 3 weeks and they've got no idea what's going on on their project and now they're worried and now because they're worrying they're starting to get frustrated at why are we working with this architect what is it that they're doing and they're just all these these drawings that don't make any sense this lack of communication that starts to undervalue and devalue what it is that we're that, that we're doing and it kind of talks to when when we when we get skilled at being able to create a, let's say a luxury experience with somebody that's like another level of listening and understanding their world because you understand that that's what a it's what they expect and b that's part and parcel why they've come to you you know they they're expecting something special you know uh, one of our clients said to me once we're not and this is somebody you know who's who's doing houses that typically they start at 5 million dollars in construction value that's a, that's a small project for them and he was saying that w- we're not usually actually competing with other architects we're competing with other luxury experiences that this client has access to we're competing with the safari in tanzania or we're competing with being able to go on a private jet and go and see the super bowl on the sunday afternoon or we're competing with um you know the whole family being taken to a five star luxury michelin star restaurant or whatever it's those sorts of experiences that we're that we're competing with and understanding that that kind of psychology means that we can create a way of communicating that's valuable and that way of communicating elevates our entire services without us having having to do any extra work yeah absolutely i mean how many of us know well here's the thing when i was uh, it just reminded me Ryan of something like when i was a kid my i grew up on a teacher my dad was a teacher so we grew up on a teacher salary nine kids in our family I mean, I know that's unheard of in England. That's even kind of unheard of in the United States. So, like, I have eight siblings. It's like, whoa, that's a big family. And, uh, and my father was a teacher. That's all. My mom, she stayed at home. She was a very capable woman. She she actually, um, at a college graduate, she was a certified teacher. She was a teacher herself, but she devoted her time to staying at home. But to make ends tight, ends, ends were tight growing up, like, ends were tight and making ends meet and so one thing that my mom did is she had a part-time job where uh, she would do this secret shopping which is something that you know franchises will hire companies to send in these clandestine shoppers so you don't know who they are they're going to come they're going to buy some items and they're going to test out your customer service they're going to test you to see if uh, any any potential um if people are stealing so we basically we would do this thing where like when we went to a one of the clients was AMPM, which is a little mini mart that they, they're very popular for gas here in the US. And we would we had a very specific my mom would take me as a as a as a kid. It's probably child labor, probably illegal or something, but hey, you know, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, she would she would go, she would purchase her item and uh, then I would come purchase my item, and then I would add on something when they had the till open. So when the register was open, I'd be like, Oh, could I also get this candy right here? Uh, because that's a perfect opportunity for employees to steal money because they cannot ring it up. They can take the money you give them, just put it in their pocket. There's no record of it having ever having transacted. So we'd, we'd do things like that just to test the internal processes. And then we'd rate the cleanliness of the store. We'd go and check out the toilets, the demeanor of the employees, you know, were they, were they smoking marijuana on the job or you know, what was actually happening. And, um, and the owners found this very valuable. 
I think this would be a great experience speaking back to your idea of like people are in it for experience for architecture firms. Like, have you ever actually called up your own firm from a client's perspective to see what that experience is like? I know I have. Sometimes I, I call up and let's face it, sometimes I know even probably some of you who are listening to the many, many of you who are listening to the podcast right now, let's face it, you're not good phone conversationalists. You would rather never speak to anyone on the phone and you absolutely hate it like I did when I was in an architecture firm. And so then the phone rings, no one's available to answer it, so you answer it. And so they have their introverted, you know, um, intern architect answering the phone, and, and he's not good at all talking to people, and he'll just be like, Hello. Like, yeah, um, I was hoping to speak to so and so. This is this is uh, this is James 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 um, James Simich, and um, you know we have a problem over here on the job. And I was wondering if Blair's around. Yada yada yada. Whatever. It's like, okay, um, let me check. You know, it's like it's it surprises me when I talk to when I call other service providers. It's not just architecture. I mean, other small businesses. Sometimes you'll call, and it's wonderful when some just just the very aspect of how you answer the phone can mm -hmm. give someone an experience. So think about that in terms of your firm, in terms of, you know, who do you have answering the phone? Have you trained them to what they say when they when they respond to someone? What's the experience that you're that's your that you're creating for them? Because the fortunate thing about that is in architecture it's not too hard to stand head and shoulders above a lot of firms out there who never put any thought to these kind of things. So if we want to stop being perceived as burdens, want to start being seen as valuable assets. Ryan makes a great point, which is the experience can actually overshadow, even not just for high-end luxury clients, but the experience can actually overshadow the whole actual, even the delivery of the of the architectural process. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's an area where it's an easy win for so many practices. And to, to really tackle this idea of being seen as a, as a burden is creating this extraordinary experience for the for the client and in, in order to, be able to do that you need to understand where they're at and what they're looking for and some and also be intelligent enough emotionally intelligent enough to realize that there's certain things that they may never express to you there are certain things that they will express and you can and actually what clients are willing to express and share with you is quite incredible if you're willing to put in the work to learn this conversational skills to be able to get it from somebody Exactly. And, yeah. and if one person shares it with you, then you can put it into your bank of experience and make an assertion that, well, if that one person feels that way, then there's a good likelihood that a lot of our other clients feel the same way. And then it becomes easier for you to start to elicit these kinds of intimate things, for example. And this, this all creates you know a lot of a lot of value because you're helping the client explore what their motivations are for a for a project and absolutely and again yeah. and you know and again just just kind of being clear with if you're working with developer commercial commercial clients then how often do you get involved with what they're talking about in their business agendas you know how how much do you know about what their business is um I went. I, I sort of can't love a little story here. I went out for dinner the other night with my friend in New York, who works in real estate. And he was every time I go for dinner with him, he kind of tells me these stories that just blow my mind of what's happening in the in the real estate industry. And he was explaining to me how developers um, buy and trade air rights on properties. So you can buy the air rights above a church, for example, and then put it onto your site. And you can buy the air rights of neighboring properties and put it onto your site so that you can go taller. And developers will often do little tricks or moves where a few blocks down the road or a few kind of um, buildings down the road, they'll buy little slices of land through another, another building to kind of join them up so they can get access to buying the, the air rights on, a, on another project and this can be quite a complex sort of set of maneuvers that you know that a lot of people the people in the developers team have very thoughtful analysts and people kind of playing this kind of tetris like game if you like and there's a lot of work that goes into kind of acquiring that and then when they go to the architect from the developers perspective they often think well we've done a lot of the hard work here 
in yeah, we, solving it. We created it. all the value. We've we've carved out value where there was none before. We uh, we bought the air rights, whereas this was not able to fit this many units. Now it does. It's massive impact on the bottom line. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I was asking how many how often do you get architects coming at coming to you with some of these solutions or kind of you know these sorts of ideas? And he was like, very rarely, if at all, yeah. that he can remember. Yeah. And and he was like and he was like sometimes from our perspective, when we're now dealing with architects, we feel like we've done a lot of the thinking already in the project. Mm, that's so fascinating. Hmm. And now it's the architect's job just not to mess up the envelope. Well, in that case, you can see why sometimes they perceive that um, that the architects are just there to stamp plans or to uh, to initiate a design that's already been conceived by someone else or to implement a solution that's already been uh, conceived and developed. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 fascinating. So I, th I think one of the kind of ways to again to create value, we're talking about our ability to educate a client to communicate with them, to conceive that our value creation is an ongoing enrollment conversation, i.e. we've got to enroll another person into being able to see our value. And it's an ongoing process that will happen throughout the project. And most importantly, it's a process that can happen before a project even starts. And we often see the clients, the architects, who are the best at being proactive with starting this kind of conversation with their clients, i.e. they're being proactive with their marketing, they're being proactive with their prospecting, they're going out and finding people, they're going out and researching the industries and the sectors that they're working in, they're listening intently, they're getting into conversations, they're picking up the phone. These guys have a massive advantage in being able to create value because they've been doing all of this front-end work of understanding the problem, understanding where the motivations are, and being able to identify who the key players are and and starting conversations in that in that direction and when you do that you know you're able to go in and position yourself you just got you've just got space to position yourself and to position yourself as an advisor absolutely as, oppo yeah. as opposed to waiting for the developer to figure out all of the things that they think is valuable absolutely yeah, and then yeah. then they're like, literally, we just need to find the cheapest architect who can fill out the box that we've created. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's not that difficult because we've done all the hard work. Yep. And so there we are, right? Now here's the thing: if you communicate value, you get paid more money. You make money. You become filthy rich <laughs> if you're able to convey value. It's not just about conveying the value of architects. Like this actually translates into dollars in your bank account, into your firm's bank account. More profitable projects. And the impact of having more money in your firm means that you then have the funds to be able to hire high caliber team members. So we can see that if we boil this down to the core, this skill is so essential. Now, some of our listeners may be asking, okay, Enoch, Ryan, that's great. How do I communicate the value? How do I, how do I do this? Like, what is a framework for doing that? Well, this is one of the things that we teach in Smart Practice Method. Right, so how to communicate a framework for communicating value? Because one thing to say, oh, just communicate the value. It's another thing to have a framework that you can follow. A framework is not a script. A framework is a, it's a it kind of like the bones of a conversation. How you direct the conversation to communicate value, and this is one of the the mainstays of smart practice methods. So, if you're a small firm owner, you want to get better at communicating your value. You see the ability, the the delta the upside of being able to communicate your value powerfully, well, I invite you to go check out our 60-minute firm owner masterclass we talk about it here on the podcast. It's at Smart. Now, Ryan, as we pivot and end up this conversation today, I just wanted to ask you a little personal here. Uh, recently, you got into boxing, right? You started taking boxing classes at a gym in New York. How, how, how is that going? So did you, are you going to pick that up in the U? Tell us about that. What, what prompted you to go? I mean, you had this great story about walking into this boxing gym in like Harlem. It was like, I was like, what? So... Yeah, I, I, I wanted to get into, a, I've always liked martial arts. I've done lots of different martial arts and I've done Muay Thai, I've done Wing Chun. And I was looking for a gym. I went into the local gym that was had all the machines there was, and they were pretty scummy. And then I saw that there was this uh, boxing gym up on 125th, like uh, in the Mexican style of boxing. And I walked in and immediately I was like, yes. This is the, 
this is the place, just people smacking the crap out of bags. It was intense training, good vibes, good music. Everyone just focused on one one thing, and it was a very kind of technical place. But I, I got into it. I was, I was going about four times a week down at the gym and was thoroughly in, enjoying it. Even got to do a little bit of sparring just before I left. Oh, nice. Yeah, I did, I did, what, you did intrigue. You did pique my interest. You say the Mexican style of boxing. What is that? Is that like we beat you to a bloody pulp? What is the Mexican <laughs> style of boxing? It's just it's a, so it was run by like a Mexican family, and it's, like, it's a kind of like a Mexican ped- pedigree of different fighters. And if you look at different styles of fighting, so like there's Soviet style, there's Cuban style, there's American style, there's English style. There, it's quite nuanced. I'm still trying to learn myself what's the different thing, you know, the, the different kind of postures and footwork and and kind of the, some of the different strategies for like how people, you know, use the ring, utilize the, the ring, the kind of fighting strategies, how you position yourself, you know, different ways of head movements. You might know like, you know the the Philly shell is the is the kind of famous American style boxing that Floyd Mayweather is very good. It's very defensive. You keep your hand down and you're bobbing, um, kind of bobbing and weaving like that. And uh, the 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 I couldn't really tell you exactly what the nuances are with the with the Mexican style, ex- except for it's it's good. But you'll and, you'll, uh, you'll know you'll you'll find out as you get better. I'll, 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 as I'm, as my eyes are kind of slowly developing and understanding what's happening in the ring and how people are moving, you start to kind of recognise the, the nuance in it. It's very beautiful, I must say. Like I I think boxing is just the footwork that's involved. It's like a dance. In fact, everything is to do with the footwork. Like all the power that comes out of your punches is, is more to do with where your feet are placed than mm. like how much muscle you've got and how heavy you're throwing something. But I was amazed actually at just um I did a bit of sparring with a young guy who's in he must have been in his early twenties. And wow, you're quite quite brave, uh, Ryan. Uh, well you're I you know spring I, chicken yourself. And well I fear that people don't realise how old I am sometimes <laughs> when I'm in these places. <laughs> like, hey, take it easy, man. You pull the punches. <laughs> so how that how that sparring I, match go? I just well what uh, it was a couple I did. One one guy, I just literally, I could not land anything on him. Oh wow! Couldn't land a thing on him. Wow! And and we did it because he was quite, he was at a skill level quite a bit more than me, and, and so he just all he was doing was defense, was just okay. defensive footwork. Oh geez, wow, wow! And it was like trying to punch a paper bag, like you know, just in the wind. As I moved towards him, he in just tornado. Just floated, yeah, he just floated out of the way, and I was yeah. like, oh my god. And and the other thing that I found amazing was just the stamina of some of these guys. Mm. You know, I'm there just getting totally gassed out in the space of five minutes, and they're yeah, just not even breaking a sweat. Yeah, yeah. But so, great. any any plans to keep the physical activity up over there in uh, the UK? Yeah, I, well, there's a there's a little boxing club around the corner here, so I'm only here for a couple of weeks. So okay. I'm gonna get down there, and I've got yeah, my old yeah. I've got my old boxing gloves here as well. So yeah, because the English, I mean, let's face it, they're in the boxing as well. You know, we got English, it. We the got Irish. we got the yeah, we got the world champion heavyweight is is really? British. We've got really? the okay. best heavyweights in the world at the moment. Mm. Are all British? And they're yeah. all there's a good heritage, certainly in the East End of London. Yeah, a good heritage. So, right, describe her. to me what's the difference. Like, as a as an American, I would I would say I refer to English people, which of course would be people from England. There's multiple areas, in, but why do why do you say Brit? What's the difference between a British person? As is a totally ignorant question. So, that's a good question. Though. Bear with me. British versus this is for our podcast listeners. Not only architectural business information, you're going to get some some cultured information. Although you it's probably bit, already all know this. Well, no. Well, it's it's a very nuanced question, right? So the British Isles includes the UK, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Yes, I think that's that's correct. And typically when I say British as opposed to English, for me personally, British means a much more diverse meaning. Um, diverse meaning it includes Scots, it includes Irish, it includes or, or just it includes even, all of that even more and- than that. And more than that, like okay. it includes, like it includes. So it doesn't include race. Well, it, oh, it includes yeah, well, colonies it, as well. Yeah, and it includes like everybody who's like here in Britain right now. I see. 
I see. Whereas yeah. English is a bit kind of myopic in the UK anyway. Like, let's say you 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 have an English fat flag outside of your house.、Mm-hmm. Generally, it's considered a little bit racist. Okay, what what is the English flag? Is it is it not the、um, is it not the the British flag? So the so the you got the Union Jack, the Union which Jack, yeah, which is a beautiful flag, the blue the blue one, the red one, and the white one. And the Union、yep. Jack is actually the English flag, the Scottish flag, and the Welsh. Ah,、oh. actually, all combined together. Ah, the yeah, Eng- okay. The English flag is just a is just a white flag with a red cross on it. Saint、okay. George's Saint George's cross. Okay. Okay. Which Saint George wore on his shield, I believe, as he was.、So、kind of, yeah, I can see the kind of the 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 militant undertones to something like that, like harkening back to the Crusaders. It's the yeah,、uh, the, the, it's, the, the, it's, the, the the English heritage. Yeah, it's it's kind of, but it's it's interesting because in the UK we have the England football team, and that's the one area where where people get very patriotic about being English. Yeah. But、mm. in most other sports, we compete as. Great Britain, fascinating. Well,、so、there you have it. Th- there's the British Isles, there's the United Kingdom, there's Great Britain, there's England, Scotland, Wales,、uh, well, wait, Northern wait, Ireland. Great Britain. How is Great Britain different than the the United Kingdom? So I stumped you here. Ryan's going、no, to get back to us on that I, one. I've got a little,、okay. I've got a little, a little Venn diagram that explains it. But it's,、ah, it is,、ah, okay. it, it's not, it's not, it's a good question because it's not actually that straightforward. But I, but I would say and and. And for me personally, I use the word British to describe myself because it kind of encompasses a lot of the other international experiences and places and heritage that I have. So, for example, Avon is she's Kenyan, and my mother is Guyanese, and both of those countries are were former colonies, and you know. That for me is kind of under the umbrella of Great Britain. That makes sense. Beautiful. So look, there you go. Well done, Ryan. I'm impressed. I pulled that question out just out of the blue. See if you could answer. So we we are now <laughs> becoming multicultural here on the Business of Architecture podcast. So we've、question. covered a lot today. Yeah. So get out there and yeah, help convince the world that we're not burdens. How about that? Love it. Architects are taking over the world in a positive way. Awesome. And that's a wrap. And one more thing: if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show, and we'd love to get your feedback, and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of, and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you. Please follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.